Good morning. My name is Mark Hobie. I'm the producing artistic director here at Paper Mill. I would like to thank you all for joining us to celebrate the life and achievements of Paper Mill's cherished friend and supporter, Governor Brendan T. Byrne. I especially want Ruthie and Governor Byrne's children, grandchildren, and all of his family to know that all of us at Paper Mill consider it an honor to host this memorial service for a truly great New Jerseyan and a beloved member of the Paper Mill family. I would like to welcome to the stage members of the Paper Mill Playhouse Broadway Show Choir, who will begin this morning with a song. There are so many friends and members of the governor's family here, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage Governor Byrne's son, Tom, who will lead the service this morning. Mark, thank you so much for uh, opening the uh, Paper Mill Playhouse uh, to uh, all of us today. Um, 
as you know, my father had uh, many great times here, many great memories here, and as you also know, uh, he really loved his show tunes. Um, <laughs> I remember uh, years ago accompanying my uh, father and my mother <clears throat> to a memorial service for former Governor Cahill. And at the end, it was naturally somber, and um, we got back in the car, and there was silence for a couple minutes, and finally my father broke the silence by saying, if you want your friends to come to your funeral, you gotta go to theirs. <laughs> so, on behalf of my father, <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, it, it happened quickly and, and frankly mercifully, but um, in organizing this, um, I guess we didn't realize that, um, uh, I guess it conflicted a little bit with uh, a legislative uh, session, and maybe there's some symbolism in that too, I don't know. <laughs> um, but um, uh, on behalf of, um, of Ruthie and her family, and on behalf of my siblings, Nancy and Tim, and Barbara and Bill, my wife Barbara, and our four kids, and the other grandkids, and the extended family, Thank you again for being here, not only for being here, but thank you also so much for the outpouring of already of so many kind notes and uh, wonderful uh, memories. I thought I knew them all, but I, I've learned new stories even in the last couple of days, so thank you uh, for all of that. I want to thank in particular uh, his successors in office who are here today, and I want to say a special thanks to uh, Governor McGreevy uh, for the companionship and comfort that he gave my dad just in his last couple of days. Um, long, a long time ago, I asked my father what kind of service he would want, and of course he said, surprise me. <laughs> but he, he did make it clear that uh, he did not want a long program and that, you know, he gets bored easily and so forth, and uh, Ruthie, Ruthie reminded me of that um, just earlier, and I, I, Ruthie asked me to relate this conversation, frankly. Um, she said, you know, if the program goes on too long, he'll leave. <laughs> and I said to Ruthie, I said, don't worry, he already did. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think he sort of appreciates the, the humor, um, and we want to, you know, try to make today as much of a, a, a celebration of his life and um, um, share the, you know, the happy memories. Um, there is more to say than we can possibly do today. And so, as I've told some of you, um, um, I will um, try to organize a, some kind of a retrospective on his life and times in his administration, probably on the Princeton campus, hopefully in early April, maybe around his birthday, April Fool's Day, which we tried to keep a secret when he was in office, um, so that people who couldn't get here today and any of you um, can hear from some others and we'll conclude it with a reception so that you can catch up with old friends, mingle, exchange uh, memories, and so on. Um, so I, I, I tried to um, uh, greet as many of you as I could uh, earlier today without holding up the line. Um, so again, I thank you and I'm glad I did it then because can't see any of you now. Um, so what I want to do now quickly is just uh, introduce the program and, and frankly the speakers who, who really need no introduction, um, beginning with uh, Joseph Cardinal uh, Tobin, who I have to say I believe is simply a, a great gift to the state of New Jersey. Um, his warmth is just extraordinary and was immediately apparent to me three weeks ago when we were at a St. Patrick's Guard of Honor uh, luncheon. And the cardinal came around from his side of the table. My father was sitting, and the cardinal got down on one knee so that they could talk more easily at, at eye level. And I couldn't help but think to myself, if my father were in any better shape, the postures would have been reversed. <laughs> uh, so thank you for being here. Um, then uh, we'll hear from um, Governor Christie, um, 
And I, I know that uh, my dad and Governor Christie uh, identified with each other and, and got along very, very well uh, personally. I mean, um, maybe having grown up in adjacent towns uh, up here um, as prosecutors, and I suppose, uh, and just as personalities that meshed. And um, um, I, I think just the common experience that, you know, no, maybe nobody else can relate going through the good times and, and maybe more importantly, understanding the bad times that a governor goes through, which happily you've all forgotten in my father's case. Um, and uh, so again, thank you, Governor, for, uh, for being with us today. And then of course, uh, Governor Kane um, will speak. Um, and uh, Governor, um, as you know, he loves so much about your friendship. Uh, I don't know what else to say, except that I guess we should call you two perfect together. <laughs> uh, he loved doing the Ledger column with you, um, both the Ledger and on, uh, on NJN, uh, so much that he probably doesn't even mind that you get the last word. <laughs> um, and then um, the, the choir will be back up, and then we'll hear from uh, Ginny Littell. And again, Ginny, thank you for your friendship to my dad and to Ruthie and to me over all the years. Uh, you've been a great friend to them. And a little secret, uh, Ginny and I were um, opposing party chairs at the same time way back when. And even then, we were really pretty good buddies and remain so today. So thank you, Ginny. Um, so, and then I'll come back up and um, um, return with some remembrances of my own. And we'll close with uh, offerings from Father Jim Ferry of Our Lady of Lords, where the, the church where my father grew up in, and Father uh, Ferry was uh, ministered wonderfully to my father over uh, these many years. And then a closing prayer from uh, Sister Pat Cody, who has been a family friend and you know a wonderful presence in so many ways in the state of New Jersey um, for uh, so many years. And so um, I don't need to come back up and introduce um, uh, everyone all at once. And so. Uh, Cardinal Tobin, uh, again, thank you. Ruthie, Tom, and the governor's family, Governor Christie, Governor-elect Murphy, all the former governors. I'm not going to name them because it could be misunderstood that I was interjecting the litany of the saints. <clears throat> But I'd like to speak on behalf of a community that Tom was a member of for 91 years. When one enters a new community, as I did in New Jersey just a year ago, one searches for the figures whose intellect and industry have shaped the landscape, those whose indelible contributions have enriched the lives of generations upon generations. Often you have to look at monuments or texts. But in rare and valuable instances, these men and women remain among us. They're living embodiments of excellence, those whom we rightly appreciate before they leave us. Brendan Byrne was such a man. I enjoyed the privilege of spending time with Governor Byrne on a couple of different occasions a son of the Archdiocese of Newark, a leader whose career intertwines so meaningfully with the people and places that I serve. In reflecting on the man I met and on his far-reaching achievements, I focus on two words, character and justice. Now, I suppose you could say that Governor Byrne was a character. He crafted his own style that defies duplication. He charmed with a magnificent mind and a keen sense of humor. He knew the definition of blarney, the ability to tell someone to go to there in such a way they'll enjoy the trip. <laughs> Disarming and self-deprecating, New Jersey loved him most of the time. The periods when its citizens used all five fingers to salute him New Jersey loved him for his authenticity and for his honesty. Far more than just a character, Brendan Byrne was a man anchored and impelled by extraordinary character. 
a character defined by selflessness, service, loyalty, and courage. Years later, his state would require his character to lead it from confusion to clarity, from doubt to decency. Now, many tributes can be offered to Governor Byrne. I recall the most compelling. He couldn't be bought. For Catholics, his example calls to mind St. Thomas More. An attorney, a public servant, with sharp intelligence and a terrific wit. A man for all seasons who refused to sacrifice his ideals on the altar of ambition and expediency. And think about it, aren't we all better for those kind of leaders? Don't we aspire to be better versions of ourselves because of the uncompromising individuals who entered public life and were searched by its harsh and unforgiving light? When we trace the imprint Governor Byrne left on New Jersey, we of course account for his many accomplishments, from among which surfaces the second word. Justice. Justice rises and stands on strength of character. Justice in New Jersey rose and stood on the strength of Brendan Burns' character. As prosecutor and later a member of the judi judiciary, he distinguished himself as a practitioner of the law and a promoter of justice. Brendan Burns' record also reveals a man whose judgment was formed by the tradition of his faith community leading him to advocate for justice that is intolerant of inequality and exploitation, justice that promotes opportunity for and protection of the vulnerable, the marginalized, the voiceless, justice that recognizes the beauty of creation and our responsibility to care for our common home. Without question, we live in a more just state because of Brendan Burns' judgment and talent. At ceremonies such as this, we often describe someone as a person of faith. I believe that Brendan could not have reached the heights he did without that peculiar vision of the heart that's called faith. Equally as important, he is the man in whom New Jersey placed its faith. He restored trust in the notion we deserve governance by the very best among us. New Jersey kept its faith in Brendan Byrne long after he left the governor's office, holding him up as an exemplar of what we truly are and what we could be. We live in a state that was forged by his character. We continue to strive towards a state that is lighted by his vision. And we pray, God, you gave us Brendan as a gift without ever losing him yourself. Now, as we return him to you as a gift, we may, may we not lose him until we join him around our table in heaven. Amen. As I stand here this morning, I can't help but recall how many times the governor and I spoke about this day. Uh, he was a little bit obsessed with it. Um, and I'll give you a few examples. He, he told me when I became governor a couple of things to remember, and one of them was, he said, if I die while you're governor, remember, no more than five minutes. So, Governor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my promise to you. He was one of my predecessors, in fact, the only one of my predecessors who used to wander into the office unannounced. Um, Governor Byrne would show up at any time for any reason or no reason at all, and my assistant would come into my office and say, Governor Byrne is in the outer office. I'm like, okay, so I would come out to see him. Invariably, he would be standing in the same spot in the middle of the outer office of the governor, staring at his own portrait. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
He would, of course, first say to me, hello, and then he would say, it's the best one, isn't it? <laughs> and then Governor Kane, he would invariably say to me, that damn Kane, he copied everything I did, including getting the same artist that I did. <laughs> he said he did, but it's not as good as mine. <laughs> then he would say to me to get back to today, he'd say, you know why I always start with the portrait? I said, no, Governor, I don't know why you always start with the portrait. He goes, I want to make sure you haven't moved it. <laughs> I said, well, Governor, why would I move your portrait? He goes, Chris, you have to promise me that you will never move my portrait while you're here. And I said, Governor, I wouldn't move your portrait. He goes, don't put it in the dead hallway. <laughs> now, for those of you who have been to the governor's office, you know in the outer, old outer office were all of my living predecessors. But then in the hallway, from the outer office to the main hallway, there were the people who came before, and I think by coincidence, they were all dead. <laughs> so Governor Burns said, I don't care what happens in here. Don't move me into that hallway while I'm alive. <laughs> then I will know the end is near. <laughs> so I promised him I'd never move him. And as we sit here today in the new space that we occupy temporarily for the next number of years, um, he is with the living. And I think that's only appropriate because his life was one of extraordinary joy. Yes, there were problems and challenges and difficulties that all of us have in our lives, both in our personal lives and in our political lives. But with Governor Byrne, there was always a sense of great joy. Joy in the day that he was experiencing. And I saw this most particularly um, early on when I went to a meeting of the League of Municipalities when I had just been elected governor. And my old county, Morris County, had invited me to come and, and speak at their lunch. And so I was getting ready to stand up, and as I did, who walked into the Morris County lunch but Brendan Byrne? And he walked in, literally weighed down in both arms with free giveaways. <laughs> he had literally stopped at every place he could stop, and whatever they were giving away, he took. And so I had an empty seat next to me as I was getting ready to speak, and he came over I mean, in, in, someone else was speaking. He didn't care. He walked right through the middle of the room, came right to the front of the room where I was sitting, sitting and saw an empty seat next to me and sat down next to me and then kind of dropped all this stuff off either arm onto the floor. And I said, what, all, what is all that stuff? And he said, I have no idea, but there's got to be something good in there. <laughs> and I started laughing. He goes, wait till you're out. He said, you'll take the free stuff too. Uh, I will also tell you that as a predecessor, he was extraordinarily gracious and generous. Um, if Brendan Byrne had a criticism, which at times he did, it was always done privately. He would pick up the phone and call, or during one of those visits to the outer office, he would tap me on the shoulder and say, can we go inside for a minute? And then he would sit down and tell me whatever his critique of the moment was. And they were always thoughtful, and they were always genuine, and they were always appreciated. His compliments far outweighed his critiques, but regardless of what he was saying, I always knew that it came from the heart. One of my most fun memories was when he agreed one year to participate in my legislative correspondence dinner video. And he did that with Governor McGreevy. Um, I didn't know what they were going to do, and they said, you have to walk into your office. They're going to be in there. You need to be genuinely surprised. We want to catch the surprise look in your face. So we're not going to tell you what they're doing. Okay. So the thing starts, and they have me outside, and they get me to walk in, and I walk in, and what did I find? But on the conference table, the governor's conference table, was Brendan Byrne and Jim McGreevy playing ping pong. <laughs> they had put a net across the middle of it, and they were playing ping pong with each other. 
And of course, I did have a genuinely surprised look. And when, when they got done with the filming of it, and I even forget what the joke was that Brendan said, but I'm sure it was a good one. At the end of it, and McGreevy will tell you this, he, McGreevy put it down saying like, okay, we're done. And Burns like, no, 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 we're finishing this game. <laughs> Brendan said, I'm winning and I'm finishing this game with you. Uh, our last memory of the governor was when he and Ruthie, just a few weeks ago, came to our Christmas party at Drumthwacket. And Drumthwacket was such an important place to the governor because Drumthwacket wouldn't exist without Governor Byrne. He was the person who stood up and did what needed to be done, unpopular at the time, to purchase an a appropriate residence for the state's governor. Uh, and he always reveled in the changes in the place and all the rest. Uh, Mary Pat and I saw him uh, that night for the last time. We were thrilled that he had actually come, and Ruthie, as always, by his side. And we brought him down into the music room, but there were a few steps, for those of you who know that, and he was with his walker, and he had a hard time, so a few of us kind of helped him down the stairs and, and back to his walker. And I was the last person to kind of help him on to get his grip again on his walker. And uh, I said, Governor, I'm so happy you're here. Merry Christmas. Thanks so much for coming. And uh, he grabbed me and he said, I'll be at the state of the state. Be good. Be good. It's your last one. Be good. And I said, um, I'll do my best. And he grabbed my arm and he pulled me close to him so he could whisper. And he whispered in my ear, you've already done your best. You did it right, kid. Uh, that's Brendan Byrne. And that generosity of spirit is what I'll miss the most. And so to Ruthie and to Tom and to the entire Byrne family, I don't need to tell you what a gem he is and was. And for me and for Mary Pat, um, there will be a void in our lives not being able to sit with him again and laugh. His life was a great joy. Great joy not only to his family, but to everyone who had the privilege of spending some time with him. Tommy, to you and the family, to Ruthie, to Governor Christie, Governor-elect Murphy, all my fellow former governors who are now reformed politicians. <laughs> it's wonderful to see everybody here. I was thinking, you know, just before I was sworn in, we had a memorial service. And Governor Byrne was sitting where Governor Christie is, and I was sitting where Governor Murphy's sitting, and I was thinking all the thoughts going through my mind and Brendan's mind at that point, and your mind is now, and how difficult both sides can be, and how wonderful it is that you are here today, both of you. Uh, I think Brendan's favorite governor was, or president rather, was probably John F. Kennedy. And I remember Kennedy said, you know, a nation reveals itself not just in the men it produces, but in the ones that it honors, the, the ones it cares to remember. So, you know, it's very appropriate today that we here and in the state of New Jersey as a whole remember today Brendan Byrne for so many, many reasons. Uh, I guess I got to first know Brendan well when I was the young minority leader leading the Republicans in the assembly, and he was a new, young, recently elected governor of the state of New Jersey. And I was the Republican, and he was the Democrat, and I led my assembly people, and he led the state, and we had our differences, as you might expect. And we started arguing about a few things. But I don't think either of us could have ever have expected that that argument would last for 40 years. <laughs> and I loved the argument, although he was wrong, he was wrong most of the time, but I, I loved the argument. And he did too. And, and, uh, and when I left the assembly, he appointed me to the highway authority. And I said, why would you appoint a Republican to the highway authority. 
And he said, you know, it's nothing but Democrats over there. And he said, I think there's some sort of funny business going on. He said, I want a Republican to go and watch them <laughs> and to report directly to me what you find out. And I learned, as I learned so much from Brendan Byrne, and so I never let any authority be nothing but Republicans. <laughs> I always appointed a Democrat, and my Democrat in case of the Sports Authority was Brendan Byrne. I appointed him to the Sports Authority. And when I was in office, when I was elected, I was elected, some of you may remember, by the smallest margin in state history. Jim Florio and I had an incredibly close contest. And when I got there, there was nothing but Democrats in the legislature strong majorities in both houses, and I wasn't quite sure how to deal with it, and I didn't want to let this young governor Republican get too much. And I was having some problems. So I used to tell my staff that I needed some recreation in the late afternoons, and I was gonna go out and play some tennis. So I'd go out and play some tennis, and the person I played tennis with was Brendan Byrne. And what the staff didn't know, and neither party knew, was that after those tennis matches, we would sit down over a you know, ginger ale, uh, <laughs> but we would talk, and he would tell me, this is what I'd recommend. This is how you had, ought to handle the state senator. This is how you handle the state assemblyman. This is where he lives. This is what you ought to do. And I learned, and I learned. And his friendship at that time, unbeknown to anybody, it's one of the first times I ever told that story, was very, very helpful to me to getting my feet in the ground as governor and being able to work with, with, with that legislature. Uh, you know, we argued a lot, but always with civility. Because I not only respected him, I liked him. I liked him very much. And a, a, a friendship deepened. And soon, um, he was, by the way, you know, when we first got to know each other, he was very unpopular those days. And like a lot of us, you know, who are governors, he used to blame the press. I remember him saying, you know, if I were to leave the governor's office tomorrow and walk across the Delaware, the headline in the paper the next day would be, Brendan Byrne cannot swim. <laughs> but you know, he loved what we did together. When we first started the column, when we first started the TV interviews and so on, he loved that because what he used to say to me in private was, you know, I think I've still got something to say. I think I still want to be a part of things. I think I still want to contribute. And this gives me the ability to say, I couldn't contribute. I wouldn't feel I was any use anymore. And so he loved those opportunities. Although I'll tell you, when Ruthie put both of us on the road and I was Brendan's straight man, Following Brendan to the podium is not something I was fond of doing, <laughs> for obvious reasons. And he knew everything. He knew everything about so many subjects. You know, I, I think you, some of you remember, you've talked about him knowing, he and Ruthie, between them, knew every song on Broadway, every show. They could hum it in the back of the car as we were going in, going in from the 30s, 40s, 50s, no matter when it was. He could recite poetry at great length. Uh, he loved sports. There's, there's nothing much fun as having, having lunch with he and Yogi Berra. Because he would ask Yogi, do you remember that game in 1951? Did you really make that call? <laughs> and the two of them would talk of the most intimate details about individual baseball games. And he loved history. He loved history. We shared that in common. And I remember he, he had a lot, of, a lot of favorite characters in history. One of them was William Franklin. William Franklin, as probably you don't know this, was the first governor of New Jersey. He was the illegitimate son of Benjamin Franklin. So he was the first governor of New Jersey. And Brendan used to say, you know, he set a precedent that we all follow. You shouldn't really run for governor of New Jersey unless you're already a bastard. So I have loved the tributes to Brendan in the last few days. They've been absolutely wonderful, well-deserved. Uh, he, he would have loved them too, uh, absolutely. And I suspect, you know, that 
Sophocles was probably right when he wrote that one must wait in, until the evening to see how splendid today has been. So today, Brendan, we celebrate you, we miss you, and I want you to know, and I think you do know, that today all of us in this auditorium, all of us in the state, are waving at you with all five fingers. <laughs> Thank you. talk about his record while in office, 
but rather the relationships he made while engaging in the political process. Brendan knew exactly who he was, where he came from, and he never tried to be anybody else. He was comfortable in his own skin. He was user-friendly, engaging, and smart. He always wanted to get the answers to the questions that concerned the people of New Jersey. Brendan always put people around him that felt that he felt enhanced the office and made a very strong team. So many of these people were with him throughout his whole life. Anyone who spent time with Brendan or heard him speak always talked about his sense of humor. This truly was a gift he was given. As the daughter of an Irishman, I recognized how cleverly he used this gift sometimes just for a laugh, or to break the ice at an event, or even to diffuse a contentious situation. <coughs> no retelling of any joke ever got old, because he always delivered them with a twinkle in his eye. The Littells and the Burns worked together while playing for different political teams and while not always agreeing during Brendan's eight years as governor, Bob and, and Brendan's friendship endured for their whole lifetime. There was another, as Tommy said before, there was another Burn Latell matchup in the 90s when Tommy was the head of the Democrat Party and I was head of the Republican Party. Now, I'm very proud to say that even though we did take the gloves off a few times, <coughs> We stayed friends to this day. Brendan was very proud of his children and his grandchildren, and rightfully so, as they are all making their own mark while respecting what their father and or their grandfather meant to New Jersey. Throughout his life, Brendan was with many people who loved and cared for him. But Ruthie was a perfect example of a loyal and dedicated wife who made sure that Brendan attended all the events that he enjoyed and made sure that he met with family and friends for lunches and dinners while engaging everyone in political talks about what was happening in New Jersey and in Washington. So what am I trying to say here today? That, that no matter who you are, what you believe, or what you do in life, it all boils down to the friendships you make while on your journey on Earth. For Brendan, it is clear that he made excellent use of his gifts. We are all better because he shared them with us. Choir again. I was sitting there, I couldn't help thinking, you know, how much my father loved tunes, show tunes in particular. 
couldn't help thinking to myself, if he could have sung like that, he might never have gone into politics. <laughs> uh, as I said before, um, my dad would really want this day to be much more of a celebration than a day of mourning. He certainly enjoyed being a public personality and would want to focus on his wit and his work uh, in behalf of the state he loved. But I feel the need to tie that, at least loosely, to the religious precepts of faith, hope, and charity. My father was a person of faith who tried to use his God-given talents to work in public service. His values were centered on that and certainly not on money. When we were kids, he would ask us, what would I have that I don't have now if I had a million dollars? And being impertinent kids, we would say, a million dollars. <laughs> but the values and the perspective and the understanding of deeper meaning uh, certainly stuck. And he certainly did deserve the moniker of the man who couldn't be bought. It extended to the littlest of things. When I was in elementary school, he would take a bunch of us to Yankee Stadium. We'd take the A train to the D train. One of my friends reminded me that if he tried to save 15 cents by ducking under the turnstile, he was immediately corrected. The point was there was no first step down a slippery slope. But then I thought to myself, unless perhaps instead of cash, you knew to offer him Malamars or Chips Ahoy or Oreos or Tates. <laughs> I just wonder how differently things would have played out. <laughs> when I was a kid, we went to church every Sunday, but he couldn't help uh, let his questioning legal mind get in the way of faith at times. Uh, one of the stories I remember is we were at the North Ward Center uh, together one day, and um, then um, Archbishop Myers was there, and my father got up on the uh, steps at the, there and re uh, related a purported conversation that he had with the bishop where he said, do you believe everything literally that's in the Bible? And uh, for instance, do you believe that Jonah was really in the belly of a whale for three days? And the bishop supposedly responded, when I get to the other side, I'll ask him. My father said, what if he isn't there? And the bishop said, then you ask him. <laughs> and I went on and on like that. Um, when Saturday masses um, after 5 p.m. started to count for Sunday, he decided that a 4.30 wedding was close enough and it got to be a fascinating legal question on from there, what counted and what didn't, whatever. Um, my, my mother, when I was a little guy, did most of the catechism review with me, but one night he was on duty and one of the questions was, what must one do in order to for, uh, expect forgiveness of sin? And from my father I learned, first you gotta sin. Well, hopefully the good Lord thinks it's as funny as you all do, and <laughs> hopefully he weighs my father in, as you've heard, with all five fingers. <laughs> uh, just like um, my grandfather, um, my father could tell all the old Irish jokes, and there's lots of them, but he would tell me about uh, Uncle Willie, who drank so much that they had to get a liquor license to bury him. <clears throat> He would tell me, the, a lot of jokes featured Patty and Bridget, of course, and a lot of them I can't tell, but uh, <laughs> the one I can, I think, is, is about Patty was out at the bar and he staggers home and he's so drunk that as Bridget opens the front door, he, he slides against the door and falls uh, flat on his face and Bridget says, do you care to explain yourself? And Patty looks up at her and says, I have no prepared remarks but I'd be happy to take questions from the floor. <laughs> uh, and as I said, they get worse from there, so instead of 
sliding into political correctness, why don't we just turn to hope? Uh, my father's career was a beacon of hope in so many ways. Uh, many of you remember him as an accomplished and entertaining public speaker. But those who know, knew him early on or who attended his first campaign speech at Marist High School know differently. In his early days, he referred to himself as the oratorical equivalent of a blocked punt. <laughs> Few back then disagreed. <laughs> So if he could evolve as he did, surely there is hope. He had a, remarkability, a remarkable ability to make light of and synthesize current circumstances. So I remember another time being at the North Ward Center, and it was soon after I became a Democratic State Chairman, and Christy Whitman was exceedingly popular, and she had just, I don't know what, Ginny had, had combined two departments to save a little bit of money. And at the same time, some uh, Democrats got indicted, and my job was already hard enough, as you know. And my father gets up at the North Ward Center and he says, I understand that Governor Whitman plans to combine the Department of Corrections and the Democratic Party. <laughs> he said, it may not save any money, but it ought to save a little time. <laughs> so on and on it went like that. There were the jokes from his service in World War II. As you heard, he served in the Army Air Corps, but that didn't stop some exaggeration. Uh, he liked to tell the story about being a sentry, a sentry on the uh, front lines in World War II, and they see a shadowy figure in the distance and they'd yell out, friend or foe, and the person yelled back, friend, they would sing, they would, they would uh, say, all right, sing the second verse of the national anthem. And if the guy could sing it, we shot him. Or more recently, he'd say, remember those pills they gave us in World War II to keep us from getting too interested in the French girls? They're starting to work. <laughs> and as I've said before, there were the politically incorrect, the off-color ones, but I got one that's probably rated PG, I hope. Um, some of you remember how he got up at a legislative correspondence dinner years ago and proposed that we balance the budget with a new tax on Viagra. As he put it, instead of complaining, you'd have guys on the golf course bragging to each other about how much tax they paid. <laughs> and the joke went from uh, PG to R to uh, maybe X from there, so uh, I'll leave out the rest of it. But on and on they went. So for a guy that began by mumbling and fumbling, he does indeed stand as a beacon of hope. And he was a beacon of hope in more significant ways, too. He wanted every kid in the state to have the hope that comes from a good education. And you know, I think he'd be thrilled if he had known that the first Rhodes Scholar ever to come out of the Newark public school system was just announced. He would have loved it. In his second inaugural address, he expressed his hopes for New Jersey's urban areas and he did his best to revitalize our cities, Atlantic City in particular, but others as well. He lived out the hope that we would preserve our distinct natural resources and did his best to preserve some of God's most wonderful green earth in the Pinelands. He, And he said to me on a number of occasions of, of all the things he, that he felt were his accomplishments, he, he, he was, I think, the most proud of that. Um, he advanced the hope that politics could be clean and decent. My father tried to do good in uh, his life. He tried to instill values in his children of honesty, integrity, hard work, generosity, and hustle. Hustle uh, particularly on the tennis court. Uh, by the way, it was probably only a year or two ago, and from a wheelchair, that my father acknowledged that I could probably beat him in tennis. <laughs> he tried to teach us certain lessons about life. 
to make the point that things in life aren't necessarily as they appear, he would read me the poem Richard Corey. And when I was a little kid, on a cold, uh, wintry evening, he would read Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven. I can't really tie that one to charity. I think it was just to scare me, but it stands out in my mind even to this day. He tried to use public office to do good for others. And he was fond of quoting from John Kennedy's inaugural address that God's work here on earth must truly be our own. He did his utmost to bring quality people into government, and he was really proud of his appointments to the, the cabinet, uh, to the judiciary, and to so many other uh, positions. I'm not going to get into uh, stuff about taxes, except to say, heck, you know, even the Christmas story wouldn't be the same without taxes. And so if you define charity as working to improve the lot of others, he did a lot. There's not that much talk anymore about lifeline utility rates, but that was one more thing. He combined uh, humor and charity at times. There was a stretch when Princeton hadn't beaten Yale in football in 15 years. And I think it was his last year in office when uh, they finally did. And so the marching band went crazy. They marched up and down Nassau Street, and they really tied up traffic to the point where the local cops gave the band leader whatever summons it was, was enough that he wouldn't have been able to um, go to law school. And then one day the kid, without ever seeking it, gets a surprise in the mail, an executive pardon. <laughs> and you know, I, I couldn't help but notice uh, in the New York Times, my father's obituary was on the top of one page, and the Carm Cosa, the coach of that Yale football team, was right underneath, so I guess they're still kidding around about that particular day. But he leaves us with one final dilemma, as you all know, uh, where he should be buried. And Ruthie and I have talked, and we're thinking about putting some of his ashes somewhere in Hudson County. Uh, <laughs> But whatever, uh, he'll remain active in politics so long as people in public life want a role model for honesty, integrity, competence, and trying to do what's right without regard for short-term political consequence. And he will remain in our hearts as a good father, a faithful friend, a servant of God's people, and thus of God. On one of our last visits, he liked to recite, and he was good at it. And so on one of our last visits, he recited the eulogy for Frank Skeffington in The Last Hurrah. To have lived a long life, to have left the lot of many of those around you a little better than it once was, to have been genuinely loved by a great many people, and to have died in God's good grace is no mean thing to have happened to any man. And that brought a tear to his eye and sums up well how he'd want to be remembered. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for your friendship, the friendship of the whole Byrne family, Ruthie Byrne, over the years, and the friendship of Brendan to our community, whom we will miss very much. It has been a joy to minister to him, to know him, um, to be in the governor's office, in the governor's presence so many times. In this new year and season of peace and salvation, Remember these words from the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 22. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his kindness and give you peace. Amen. Good afternoon. You know, only Brendan Byrne, a Democrat since birth, would have such three well-known speakers, Governor Christie, Governor Kane, and Ginny Littell, lifelong Republicans, and a little old gray-haired nun who comes from a Democratic family speak at his funeral service. <laughs> I've noted the presence of some Hudson County Democrats today, and I understand they spoke to my brother Dick about registering Brendan for Hudson County. <laughs> but I've also noted that there are many attorneys and a former U.S. attorney and judges and Supreme Court justices of New Jersey, so they might want to consider recusing themselves from the case. But probably what many of you do not know is that the Byrne Cody families go back for generations. 
In fact, my grandfather, Papa Cody, actually dated Brendan Burns' mother, Genevieve. And while love was not in the air, both family trees produced a governor. But could you imagine if they actually had married, there would have been two governors in the same family. But seriously, Brendan Byrne was a bridge builder. He lived his life personally and professionally with thoughts and actions for the next generation and the next and the next. His legacy as a public servant, one who fought for what he felt was right for our state and for our future lives on. The Bridge Builder by Will Allen Drumgool is a poem that was found among Brendan Burns' collection. The Bridge Builder. An old man going a lone highway came at the evening gold, cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide, through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. That sullen stream had no fears for him. But he turned when he reached the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a pilgrim near, you are wasting strength in building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again must pass this way. You have crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build you the bridge at the even tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I have come, he said, there followed after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm has been naught to me. To that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I am building the bridge for him. Brendan, rest in peace my good friend, amen. Um, I've pretty much said all I want to say, um, but it says Tom Byrne closes, so I'll close. Um, um, my, my father um, said to me, you know, not that long ago, he said, um, I've had a, a, a good life, I'm ready to go, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <clears throat> And I thought to myself, you know, he, he slipped away uh, pretty quickly and pretty mercifully, and in that sense, he really got his last wish, too. Um, and so he would have loved this service. He would have loved all of you being here. I thank you again, and we're going to close with music that he loved.